So, assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of Coping in Quarantine. My name is Iman Ali and I'm the Policy and Programming Coordinator for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Today we have an exciting guest speaker from the Indian American Muslim Council, Junaid Ahmed, who will be sharing his insights on what life is like for religious minorities and giving us some input on the atro atrocities uh, occurring in Kashmir. We are always so, so proud to share our webinars with our audience because here at MPAC, we seek to inform and engage with essential discourse on the fair treatment on, and portrayal of all people, including our own community of American Muslims. But with that in mind, I urge everyone to take a vested interest in one's community. Now more than ever, we are seeing people of all backgrounds struggling. And as the prophet, peace be upon him, once said, he is not a believer whose stomach is filled while the neighbor to his side goes hungry. Ponder on this as you make your next purchase. Buy local whenever you can, give local whenever you can, and invest in your community so that we can all follow the example of the prophet in caring for our human community. With that being said, though I am miles and miles away from California, I still consider Mr. Salam my neighbor, um, so I'm going to pass the microphone on to him to get our conversation started with Mr. Ahmed. Thank you, neighbor. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Salam alaikum, uh, Junaid. How are you doing? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Alhamdulillah. So, you know, the work of the Indian American Muslim Council, we, we, we see it as activists. We know the work. But uh, explain to the broader audience why it's relevant now, uh, and uh, especially in light of the political unrest and turmoil over uh, racism in our country and the, the, the level of police brutality against African-American black, black lives. So I, I think that that's something that fits perfectly with what the mission of the Indian American Muslim Council is fighting back against uh, a, a system of, of racism um, that is structured uh, inside now um, the Indian government. And if you can explain that to our audience. Excellent, yeah. Um, you, you are right. Uh, in, 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 in today's um, uh, you know, environment, today's situation that we are uh, facing here uh, with, with Black Lives Matter and, and you know, what happened in Minnesota kind of brings into perspective what is happening globally here, right? So I'll I'll take a few steps back. Um, you know, uh, we'll go to go to go to India and kind of relate that situation here at some point. So there there are two aspects of that we're that we're dealing with here. First is is the situation in India itself, as as uh, uh, the you know the viewers here uh, may be aware. Uh, what is happening in India for the last uh, you know about six years, 10 years has been, has been um, pretty, pretty sad when you look at the global environment, global culture right now. What we have uh, in 2019, uh, August of 2019, uh, Kashmir's uh, special status was, uh, was taken away, uh, wherein you had uh, Kashmir, the state of Kashmir, which was, you know, when, when England um, left, the Britishers left India uh, in 1947, India and Pakistan got independence. Uh, without getting into the details, what, what happened uh, for Kashmir, Kashmir was one of the disputed lands that was uh, left, uh, in my opinion, by design that way. So the, the entire um, a geographical region stays disturbed. But at the end of the day, it's, it's the Muslims who are paying that kind of a price. Um, looking at the status of, um, you know, the Muslims and minorities in general in, in India is, is, uh, is extremely, extremely difficult right now. I'm um, starting with Kashmir. I'll get, take a minute or so just to talk about Kashmir. Again, I will not go into the historical details here, but what happened in Kashmir in 2019 with this article 370 taken away, um, people were put under curfew. There was no food. Uh, available to them. There was no, like internet connection is a lot of times comes first 
to me, when there is no food, there is no access to hospitals. Yes, uh, you know, the access to information has to be there. But when people were dying of hunger, people were dying for lack of medication. It, it was just a pretty rough and sad story there. And that's, that's only Kashmir, right? Yeah. Now, we can get into the and rest of India and the situation there, but I don't know, um, you know, if, if there is anything else you, you want to talk about or I can give a big picture well, of India and then come yeah. bring it back here. Before you get into India, I, I want you to talk about the BJP. What, what would be a can in the United States government or the United States Congress if we had a BJP here? Okay, uh, BJP would be uh, 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 your Republican Party, if you want to call it, but this is the Republican Party would be a much better version. But, but I think talking about BJP will not do justice to the topic. Talking about RSS, the parent organization of BJP is what will do justice. RSS is an organization that was formed almost 100 years ago, uh, over 100 years actually. And this organization was formed taking direction from directly from Hitler's teaching. If you look at the, the, the material that RSS has, it, it is a, a lots and lots of quotes. And they actually had a delegation go to Germany under Hitler and learn from him when this organization was formed. So if you're seeing all of these things happening in the last eight years, six years, but really this has been cooking for a hundred years. Now, we as Muslims and other minorities in India are, are reacting right now, and we are not happy when we get a, do not get a result within a month or six months or a year. This has been a hundred years in working. This is a fascist um, Hindu supremacist organization. I want to highlight one difference here, a difference between a Hindu and the concept of Hindutva, similar to how you have a Jew and the concept of Zionism. Most, many people will talk about Islam and the terrorism, right? Today, the, the connection between Islam and terrorism has been so strong that you don't even use the word Islam. You don't even use the word Islamist. Use the word terrorist and 99% of the time, the mind of an average American would go to Muslims. So this RSS organization is this uh, superior, uh, supremacist organization. KKK is what I would connect to them if I were to find a parallel here in the United States. And um, no regard for other faiths, no regard for other religions, a complete fascist minded Hindu superiority in India is their ultimate goal. And, and how is this different from India as a, as, as a, as a secular democracy? We, we, we have the problem of Hindu nationalism or Hindutva. And as you said, you have the problem of Jewish nationalism. We can even say we have a problem of Muslim nationalism. So how is that separate from what India stands for? So India, the core fundamental uh, you know, establishment of India was based on the secular uh, constitution. The constitution of India uh, deems the country of India, the state of India as a secular country, a secular democratic uh, country. Now this nationalism that, that the white nationalism, the Hindu country or Hindutva based, um, what it does is it takes it away from its core fundamental values of secularism and it takes it into a Hindutva superiority. All other faiths do not, and, and, and mind you, when, when we say Hindutva or even Hindu, uh, I wanna call out for our audience, we're not talking about the entire 80%. So India's population is what 1.2 billion now, off that about 70% plus 75, 70% are, are Hindus. I wanna, I wanna call out that as a, a, a fraction of that is, is the Brahmin, the people, the India has a caste system, right? When you say a Muslim, when you say a Christian, I mean, Christian has different facts, but when you say a Muslim, it's a Muslim. But when we talk about Hinduism, it's, it's not really, really a religion, right? It's a philosophy. And you have your classes. You have the Brahmin class who rules. Then you have the second and the third and the fourth. 
the untouchables, those are the ones they call the Dalits is the name, D-A-L-I-T. So Dalits are the lowest of the class and they constitute a big percentage of that Hindu population. So really the issue that this is being created, the RSS, the Hindutva, is just the Brahmins and maybe the upper class, one or two classes below that, that's it. The remaining 50 to 60% of the Hindus do not relate to that ideology. So before anybody thinks that this is a Hindu Muslim issue, I wanna make it very clear, this is not a Hindu Muslim issue. This is a fascist nationalist regime that is trying to implement their concept across an entire country and take the secular flavor of India away. And, and what are the anti-Muslim and anti-Islam tropes that they use in uh, India? There is no shortage of it. <laughs> well, let's say, you know, what are the, yeah. top, the top three or the top five that you can name? First and foremost, their, their biggest thing is, is um, uh, you know, they, they take, um, they use Pakistan as the sounding board, here, the board here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, anything that has to do with Muslims, anything that has to do with uh, anti-Indian, they, they kind of relate that they have done, they have, they have created a, a, an, a narrative here, which is working extremely well because they now have full control of the media. So they have drawn a narrative that anybody who is a Muslim is quote unquote a Pakistani supporter that relates to quote unquote um, a, a terrorist supporter, right? If you want to be a, a, a Muslim in, in India, um, even if you pray five times, a, you know, to be very honest, up to eight years ago, 10 years ago, you know, uh, somebody, there, were, there was no such thing as, as um, you know, a Muslim going to pray five times a day was taken as a threat. Today it is. Now, beef is the number one thing to answer your specific question. Beef is the one thing that they have said that, you know, they eat our mother, our goddess, right? A small percentage of India do worship God, but a majority of India does not. That's number one. The number two anti-Muslim thing that they have started is that Muslims do this um, uh, love jihad is what they called it. So love jihad is a concept where a Muslim man goes out has an affair with a Hindu woman, marries her and forces her to convert to Islam. That's the second thing that they have come up with. Obviously, there is absolutely no truth to it. You know, in a secular country like India, you will find uh, uh, so many people who, you know, Muslim women who marry, you know, Hindu men. I mean, you like it or not, that's what happens in a secular society and vice versa. But then what they do is they have done a good job of creating this narrative that Muslims are terrorists. Muslims are the one way of their terrorism is love jihad. And, and, um, and third, they, they disrespect our mother goddess and eat them. Well, I mean, that's pretty similar to a lot of anti-Muslim tropes around the world that they don't worship our God. They have a different religion. They're a cult. They're not a religion. Yep. They force their way onto... Uh, they impose uh, Islam onto uh, society, uh, and uh, they're they're violent. Uh, and from the situation in Bosnia to the situation in Rohingya to the Palestinians to so many other areas, you find the the same to India and Kashmir and the Uyghurs. You find exactly those tropes. Um, so, in the U.S., you know, there's a big uh, push for religious freedom, and I know um, India has been uh, uh, considered a, a country of po political, a particular concern, CPC, by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Uh, it, what can we do around that issue, and what else is happening in Washington that we can advocate for? Excellent question. This is my favorite part of the discussion, right? Whatever is happening in India, that's thousands of miles away. We, we can do what we can do from here. But what I want to bring to this attention, I'll use myself as an example. 
I got involved in Indian American Muslim Council July of last year. So I'm less than a year old in this organization. I was not very directly connected with what is happening in India. Obviously, you know, it's, it's one body, one part of the body hurts, the other party suffers. But one thing that kind of woke me up here is the presence that this Hindu 12 factions have here in the United States, here in Washington, D.C. I'll use uh, two examples. One, um, the textbooks in California, uh, the Muslim history was being shown as barbarians, specifically Muslim history in the Indian subcontinent, the Mughals and, and, the, and the Muslims that came to India prior to that. They were shown as barbarians. They were shown as, as people who, who were just coming to India to destroy. And this was fully uh, orchestrated and organized by uh, this Hindutva groups, the RSS version of American. So Hindu American Foundation is one. Um, they, they are now working under many different uh, smaller organizations. And this threat for us is not just for our Muslim brothers and, and the minorities in India. This threat, believe it or not, I am not exaggerating. When I'm saying what I'm going to say here, I have really thought through the statement I'm making. That threat is here in the United States, and it will impact each and every Muslim who is living in this country. This textbook example I used is a real example. Your kids and my kids would go and study those textbooks. Alhamdulillah, we were able to successfully counter that to a large extent. They wanted to implement it across the state of California. They were not able to do it. If you, if you know how the textbooks work in the United States, it's the state of California and Texas. These are the two big states who has the money to invest in curriculum development and most of the smaller states get it from them. So that's one ex example. In Washington, D.C., Hindu American Foundation has, this, has a very strong position right now. Alhamdulillah, for the last year and a half or so, uh, Indian American Muslim Council has an office there. We have been countering them, and the and the uh, the offices of the congressmen and the senators and the and the think tanks are like, where were you guys this whole time? So this is really working. And you surf example that you just said, uh, it was a combined effort by multiple organizations, IAMC taking a lead on it to actually bring what is happening in India to the forefront. But issue here, I think, to me personally, with you know, our kids going up here is a much bigger issue that we need to address in a hurry. Uh, you're, you're, you're speaking yeah, on mute. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Is, yeah. There, is there a congressional resolution or is there a particular policy that the State Department uh, is proposing that we should be advocating for? Uh, yes, there were. The Congress, for example. Correct. There were, there were two that uh, were pro that were proposed. There is one uh, by Pramila Jayapal now. So the, I will be uh, sharing, I don't remember the resolution numbers, um, but there, there has been two that has been passed already. And their focus primarily was on, on uh, you know, Kashmir and the uh, lack of, you know, the information blockout that they had. But the bigger issue of the entire minorities that, uh, you know, the new law that they have, the NAA and NCR, we are trying to work on one more. So um, there are multiple ones that are going to be floated around in the next, uh, I would say, several weeks coming up. So two already passed, more to come. And, and once that comes, I think we can work with your audience. Because see, that the, the way that works, and, and you, you ask a very, very good question here. And even though there may not be something that I can tell you right now, if, if this call was happening two weeks ago, I would have said to each one of us here to pick up the phone and, and call your congressman and senator to support this and go and attend this uh, congressional hearing uh, with USERF, um, the religious freedom uh, you know, congressional hearings that we had. That happened about two weeks ago. More will happen, but what will impact is, let's say I living in Chicago here, working with my congressmen and the senators, we, uh, you know, if we have someone here from other states, you reaching out to your elected officials is what is going to make this happen, make this change. 
And as we have these congressional um, uh, you know, uh, hearings and other forums that we need your participation in, I think please look out for those emails. When the time comes, please pick up the phone and call them. And uh, we have made a tool also where you can just click and create the letter for your senator, for your congressman. When, this, when the time comes, please do it. I have a friend of mine, uh, Abbas and Aviva, Aviva, uh, Habiba Akhil from New Mexico. Uh, I'm gonna let uh, Habiba uh, ask you a question uh, at this point. Habiba, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, Assalamu alaikum, I'm Habiba and I'm calling from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I don't know, Brother Junaid, if I know you, but I have started a WhatsApp group called Peace Lovers two years ago in 2018 regarding the issue in Kashmir and the genocide in Kashmir. And I'm a very active person who is trying to help the Muslims in India. And what I'm seeing right now is it is very easy for the Hindu Association Council or the Hindu American Council to have a voice in the United States. But for a Muslim Council to have a voice in the United States is very difficult because we constitute about 36 nations which represent the Muslim population. It's not just India which has the minority population of Muslims. It is it's everybody who is going through a, a lot of ter uh, terrorism against them and humanitarian violent deeds which are ha happening against them in China, in Myanmar, in Palestine, in India, everywhere. So for the people to unite, we as an Ummah have to unite as Muslims rather than just Indian Muslims because we have to fight for our Muslim brothers in India because of the fascist Modi government, who is almost like doing exactly what Hitler was doing. And he has made concentration camps where he has told people that no, it is, he's refusing to admit it. But I have uh, videos which show the workers who are saying they have been working on those concentration camps. And this is for the Muslim people that one day they are going to be carted off to those concentration camps. And I am telling them, for Muslims, do not be blinded. We have to stand from outside India. In India, you, um, Muslims are helpless. They cannot do anything because they are minority and the government right is now a very fascist government and friends with the United States. So, so thank you, thank you, Habiba. So, uh, Junaid, then, uh, based on what, you know, uniting the Muslims, I think a lot of the problem, exactly what she said, that you have a situation where there's so many different issues. We, you know, every t every week you you see a different Muslim population persecuted, and you don't know where to start. And the Syrians say you got to start with Syria, and the Palestinians say you got to start with Palestine, and the Kashmiris say you got to start with Kashmir. So how do we strategically uh, think about the this 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 very profound issue of persecution everywhere? I'm sure every Muslim wants to do something. They just don't know where to start. No, that's, that's, that was, um, you know, uh, the sister beautifully said, right? I mean, you, you nailed it. It's, uh, they're doing what Hitler was doing prior to the genocide in Germany. You are correct. Now to address the question as how do we bring uh, the Ummah together on this, right? And we, we kind of pondered upon this quite a bit in our youth groups as well, as well as with IAMC. And I think the answer is pretty, pretty clear for us. And I think the direction is also pretty clear. Let me tell you, um, uh, you know, what I mean by that. Every cause has to have a champion. The advantage that Jews have is Israel, Zionism, and be done with it. They're good. India now has India, and Hindutva, they're good with it. Muslims, unlike those two, have a problem, which I think is not a problem, but an advantage. Our problem, if you want to call it that, is that you just mentioned, we, have, we, have, you know, we had Bosnia in the past. Today we have Syria, Iraq. You know, um, if I count the list, it's 30 or 40 that would count. 
our solution to that is we need to have a champion for each cause. And when the time comes, everybody else supports. I personally have always participated in Palestinian causes or Syrian causes, but I'm not in the forefront. There are other brothers who are in the forefront, but if I need to take an action, then that Syrian or, or Palestinian or Indian brother or sister, that organization reaches out to the larger wider community instead of, so let's say if Indians are only 100 and combined we are together a thousand, then that 100 is focused on IAMC or Indian uh, activities. But then when an action or activity has to be taken, then I have a power of thousand behind us. And I think, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, I think we have accomplished that to a large extent. In the Chicagoland area, if there is, uh, you know, you meant, just asked me earlier about this, anything that, uh, you know, anything that we can do in Washington, D.C., anytime we have an issue like that, I have support from the entire Arab community. All I got to do is send it to two or three of my friends, a sheikh and one of my, prayer, you know, my teachers, and boom, it goes into the community and they take action on it. Now, it's a limited action. I cannot ask them to participate in every weekly meetings and all that, but when I need them, they're behind me. And I think that strategic use of our power is the key here, and every community should build that. Uh, l let me ask you another question, Junaid, is that you know, a lot of people here think that Muslims, that is, American Muslims, we should only focus on domestic issues. We should only focus on what's happening in terms of uh, Black Lives Matter and social justice. Um, and, and we cannot help Muslims abroad. How do you respond to that, that, that the priority is here and we should only focus on domestic issues? You know, um, you don't have to look any further than look in your camera. You're looking at me. I was, I was that person to a large extent, right? Not maybe exactly that. I did participate, I, but I was of the opinion that we, what can we do? Our focus should be our, our children here, our social causes here, our relief work locally, right? That was my mindset. That's where, who I was. But it doesn't take you long if you get into the actual field work, if you want to call it, that this is not separated. And I kind of, um, you know, uh, talked about it earlier, Hindutva concept, right? The Hindutva organization started in India, now they're extremely strong here in the United States. If we were active throughout the last 20 years, I think we would have a much stronger position here as an American Muslim. Now, having said that, we have to make sure that focusing on the outside international issues, we do not take in, uh, our eyes off of the local issues. It's all intermingled. It is all intertwined. You cannot say it's a local versus international issue, especially when it comes to Zionism and Hindutva. You absolutely cannot say that. So I think uh, uh, George Floyd's, uh, yeah, I, was in, I was in Minnesota last week uh, had some meetings with the local leadership there. And I'm telling you that these issues are not separated. They are one and the same. It may have a different name, different people suffering, but the causes are the same. The ideology, unfortunately, to a large extent is the same. And that's where I think these issues are extremely connected. You work for one, you obviously, I mean, you have to pick at least one. That's what I would say. I mean, sitting at home to me is a crime and not doing anything. We have to participate in our local, you know, any local issue that's happening. Like we have had like five or six different uh, events in the Chicagoland area supporting the Black Lives Matter. But at the same time, it would be a very flawed thought process to say that we should only focus on local issues, international, we cannot do anything about it. That's wrong. I have traveled to 60 plus countries and I will tell you something, if there is Muslims anywhere on the planet that can do something, those are the Muslims in this country. So yeah, sitting at home is not an option for us. Thank, thank you for your good work. And I'm gonna send it back to Iman, uh, who, who has questions from other, uh, other people who are listening. I know Habiba had a lot to say and she has a lot more to say. Unfortunately, we ran out of time on that section and now we're gonna send it back to Iman for other Q&A. 
Absolutely. And thank you so much, Mr. Ahmed, for sharing your insights. I think that it is so vital to recognize that neighbor doesn't necessarily mean the person that you can go knock on the door in, in five minutes. Neighbor can mean anyone that you feel connected to, anyone that you feel is in your community. And, and you know, that's the beautiful thing about being in an ummah. It's that you could be a thousand miles away or five feet away, and then we still owe an obligation to, to ensuring that the rights and securities of, of each human being is, is is protected. But with that being said, you know, I'm hearing all of these wonderful, great ideas. And I, and, and I want to go back to your point that you made earlier about the books um, in, in, I believe, California, the school books that were being processed. As someone who recently graduated um, with her master's, I recognize that there is a deep flaw in the educational system when it comes to fair portrayal of certain communities. And with that being said, you know, for those who are perhaps in the younger generation, whose parents came here and then we, you know, are born and bred Americans, who didn't get that firsthand experience of what it's like to live in Pakistan or Palestine or Syria or Kashmir or wherever, what can we do to educate ourselves? Are there resources that IAMC provides? Um, are there certain books that you recommend, documentaries? What, did it, what is it that we can do to hold ourselves accountable so that when we are in these classroom settings and these tropes are being spewed, we can combat them with, you know, facts? No, um, I, I think uh, I'm, 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 I'm actually... Uh, uh, pretty pleased to hear the question that uh, a younger generation is actually talking about books. That's <laughs> nice to hear. That's pretty refreshing. Yeah. Uh, I thought we were done with it. No. Um, so, so look, there is, there is a lot of uh, material out on the internet. I think there is, I'm not going to spend time on what uh, to read, but I will conceptually uh, focus on one thing here. This issue of this, this global issue that of, of the right-wing extremism, the, the, the nationalism, the uh, religious and the racist superiority concept. Nobody can say, and this is a conversation that, you know, early on, I, I came here as, as, as a, you know, when I was 13. So I kind of, you know, had that background from India to a large extent. Um, but at the same time, kind of, you know, spent a, a lot of my growing years here. Now, I was having this, and I'll, I'll share the story, maybe that will help answer the question. I was having this lengthy discussion about three weeks ago with my nieces and nephews about, you know, uh, when we were talking about, so my, my, my niece comes up to me and says, uh, Chacho, what can I do? Uh, because I, I really don't relate with India. I said, look. The, when you're talking about India, you're not talking about Gandhi. You're not talking about Bollywood movies. You are talking about a concept that has originated in India and has migrated to this country. Forget India. You are going to pay a price here. Your children, you yourself have read those textbooks. Your children are going to read the same textbooks. You are going to deal with the, the presence that, you know, in school boards, if you do not have your presence in the school boards, the, the news media that they're being, you know, they're focusing and they're casting you as someone this, you know, as a fanatic, as, you know, uh, you know this uh, extremist, this is all connected in the background. You cannot say this is a Philistine story. You cannot say this is uh, India or a Pakistan or a Kashmir story anymore. That days are far behind us. Even, you know, 20 years ago, you could say that, oh, no, I don't relate with India. That's Bollywood. I'm not interested. Yes, I'm not interested in Bollywood either. But at the same time, the results that we are seeing, we are facing, our kids are going to face are, are disastrous. Let's get out of that mindset that this is uh, a back home issue. There is no such thing as a back home issue anymore. Those issues are imported here and we are facing those. Anybody who is involved in the Washington DC, uh, they will know that all of these international, uh, you know, the, the big people with money, the kind of impact that they're having, that we, when we have our own people there, we feel like we are minnows. It, it's like major league versus minor league, really. That's the, that's the level of difference. Come out of that mindset, people. 
Now, in terms of how you can educate yourself, um, I don't, I don't know. I'm not, you know, I, a, a textbook does not come to my mind, but I think this is a, a very, you know, generic information that's available um, online. And if you just go to, there is, you know, there's an art that, you know, uh, we have an intern that she's working on an art exhibition, Born and Brought Up in It's Amina, States. right? That's correct. Yeah, she's yes. wonderful. If you guys, uh, to our audience, anyone who has a chance, um, she is all over Twitter, big, big uh, superstar on Twitter, does great, great work for IAM IAMC, is the reason why I was actually connected to, to Mr. Janaid. So please do check out this project because it is so, I, I agree with you, so essential in understanding um, the, the narrative that, that we hold. And I, I don't mean to cut you off, but one of the things that I'm just thinking when, when you're saying this, you know, um, MPAC is working on, on a, a phenomenal campaign uh, uh, entitled, you know, our human security campaign. And one of the key points in the human security campaign is this notion that until, you know, basic needs, basic securities, basic protections are met of all individuals, we cannot expect that the national security of any nation will be upheld. Um, and I'm so moved by you saying that this is no longer a back home story because I just think about the bravery that that first generation parents had when they came to this country. You know, many of them came with with very little money in their pocket, very little experience of, of being in a new country. And, and they definitely set a foundation for, let's say, the, the second generation of of, of, of families. But with that in mind, one of the, the notions that I often hear is that, you know, don't say anything on Facebook, don't say, don't, don't be too activist -y. don't do this, don't do that. Whether, you know, you're the one standing with the poster in, in Black Lives Matter Plaza in front of the White House, or you're running for a seat on your child student council board, whatever, I think these are all examples of how um, being there, being present is a vital aspect of getting the conversation started. And for those who you work with, I, I wonder what advice do you have for, for those who still have that mindset of, I'm here, I have a roof over my head, I'm good, I don't need to get any more involved than that. What is it that we can do to kind of catalyze this notion of, no, this is our responsibility. Um, and if you have the ability, you have the responsibility. I'll use two stories here. And I think that would, that would connect, that would relate with our audience here. And, and honestly, it's certainly related with me. Um, I, I met a sister here in Chicago. Son is about nine years old. And the son tells the mother, and, and you know, I got almost tears in my eyes when I, when I heard this. Um, they're going to a parent-teacher conference and on the way, uh, they park the car, they're walking to the classroom. And on the way, the son says, Mom, can you not tell them we're Muslims? This is a nine-year-old saying, can you please tell them, don't tell them we're Muslims. And that was because of the notion in this country, or at least in, in this kid's classroom. I don't know if it was the teacher or other students. That is not a back home story. It all ties back in. If you do not wake up, if you do not get active within your communities, if you are happy with having a roof over your head, think again, it could be your kid tomorrow. And I'll share a second story. This was when I was in Houston. One of the uncles walked up and we were talking and he goes, you know, after my speech, he comes up to me and he goes, you know, my son has refused to attend a class. And this is a high schooler. This is a freshman in high school. He has refused to attend a class. I was like, why so? Then he actually, while we were talking, he asked his son to take a picture, sent back how, how Muslims were shown in such negativity that he is like, screw it. I don't care if I get a C in this class, I am not going to attend. This is not Mumbai, India. This is not Jerusalem. This is not Syria. This is Houston, Texas, United States of America. Wake up, people, before it's too late. Well, Habiba has another question. Uh, Iman, why don't you read it about making people know who we Muslims are? 
Absolutely. So uh, Ms. Akhil says, it is long overdue that we become active and fight for our Muslim rights here and abroad. It has come from within to educate people about Muslims and turn the ignorance of the West towards what the true Muslim values are. Um, she just actually received an Albuquerque Award for our Navajo Nation in New Mexico for helping them um, reach out to our neighbors first and help non-Muslims first and set an example for others. So I believe that the, the heart of the question is, you know, um, I think it, it is very easy at times to, to say that, look at what's happening in this country and this country and my Muslim neighbor here, this charity starts at home, right? Good starts at home, whether it's a um, green person, yellow person, blue person, whatever person. It, if we can help, it is our responsibilities because of our deen to, to offer assistance. And, and I commend you, Ms. Habiba, for, for receiving that award and helping such a vulnerable population because absolutely, um, it is the best of us who help our communities. And, and, and we are very proud of you here at MPAC. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I wanna ask one, uh, one final question, and this is a bit in regards to the pandemic that we are facing, you know? Um, for about three months now, many states have been in quarantine, uh, self-isolation, things like that. COVID has left no part of the globe, I think, unturned or untouched. Um, and with that in mind, the CDC released, I believe two months ago, a um, document stating that in the United States, African Americans are disproportionately um, dying at higher rates of COVID than any other demographic. Now, when we look to India, I have heard, um, I've read news articles stating that Muslims will go to um, the local hospitals to receive treatment and will not will be turned away merely because they are Muslim. And I'm wondering that with these kinds of policies and tactics, are there certain populations that are impacted at a higher rate in, in India as well? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And this is this is uh, one of the key topics we which we had not uh, touched. Um, in India, they're blaming Muslims for this spread of COVID-19. So they're using every opportunity uh, to uh, somehow, if they're able to connect. So to your question, a short and simple answer is yes, absolutely. Muslims are at a huge disadvantage of being treated. I personally heard one, two, six stories where the patient was taken from hospital to hospital to hospital. They would not admit him or and in some cases her and they all passed away. And one of them was my aunt, my uncle's wife. She was elderly. She was taken to six different hospitals. She was turned away and she eventually passed away. And I heard another story. So she was elderly, so okay. It was another story, not acceptable. I'm not saying it's acceptable, but, but regardless. There was a 38-year-old kid. I should say, a man, 38 years old. He had an asthma history. They carried the folder with him to the hospital that look, he has been treated here in, you know, this, he's a regular patient here. This has nothing to do with COVID-19. He's having an asthma attack. You know, this is the history. They refused. Second, third, by the time they make it to the fourth hospital, he died. These are personal stories that we have heard from people that we know over in India. So yes, there is a direct impact. Absolutely. And thank you again, Mr. Ahmed, for joining us. I have us. one comment, if you allow me. Just yes. one very, to your last question. I, I think this is very important for, for people who want to say that, yes, I have a head. I don't wanna, you know, I don't see any reason why we connect with back home. I'll use uh, Raja Krishnamurti. He is a congressman in the district that I live in. Uh, uh, from Illinois, uh, Congressional District 8. He, Muslims supported him big time here, but now he is a big time Hindutva supporter. On the face value, he says he is for equal rights. He says all of this. And this I wanted to use as an example that is our lack of activism. It's lack of our participation that people are being completely 
you know, taken over by that ideology, by that thought process, that if we still do not wake up now, who else do you want? What else do you want to see? It is your, the person who is representing me in my district is a Hindutva minded person. I just wanted to use that as an example. No, so with that, with that being said, for, for all of you who are able to vote, to our viewers, make sure that you are registered, you are able. If you ever have any questions uh, about voting, please go ahead and email hello at mpac.org. We'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Um, we, absolutely, unless we raise our voice, there's no one who's going to come and bring the mic right under your mouth. So. Great, great points, Mr. Ahmed, and thank you again so, so much for, for joining us today. I encourage everyone to please uh, connect with Mr. Ahmed at all possible. And Mr. Ahmed, I'll be getting some websites and resources from you that we can share with our audience members who are interested again. Um, to everyone watching, we hope that you have a safe and happy night. And please join us um, for our next webinar, which you can find at www.impact.org forward slash webinars. Until then, have a safe night and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank we'll you. We work together, inshallah. It was great.